Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jennifer Widman. I'm the director of the South Dakota Center for the Book. And on behalf of the South Dakota Humanities Council, I would like to welcome all of you to the annual South Dakota Festival of Books. We are so pleased that you've joined us for our virtual 2021 event. We would like to acknowledge first and foremost that this program comes to you from the homeland of the Ocheti Shakawi, the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota people. The South Dakota Humanities Council honors and appreciates the indigenous people who have the longest relationship to this place. Before the event gets underway, I'd like to share the usual housekeeping details. We do ask that you keep your microphone muted throughout the event to minimize background noise. If you would like to ask questions or share comments with tonight's presenters, you can type them in the chat section here on Zoom, which you can open by clicking on the conversation bubble if you hover your mouse at the bottom of the screen. Or you can put those in the comments section on Facebook at any time throughout the event or toward the end when we do some Q&A and I will pass along as many as possible along with our other moderator at the end of the session. To help us continue to improve the festival, we'd appreciate your filling out an evaluation form. Uh, let's see. We will email you a link to this form after the event. And finally, you can help keep the festival free by making a tax deductible donation to the South Dakota Humanities Council. And I think, do we have Jessica here? I don't think we do. So I am just going to say that while we are in festival mode, um, you can make a donation through our website, um, by mail, in person, by phone, and you can find all that information on sdhumanities.org. And we will enter you into a drawing uh, to win a couple of big gifts if you give us a donation of $100 or more. We have a lovely original painting uh, by Sioux Falls artist Roger Ellingson, which inspired the front cover of our guide. And we also have some really great gift baskets with, of course, lots of books and other goodies in them. But anybody who donates any amount of money during the festival will get a prize of some sort, and they're all good. So we appreciate your support. We also appreciate the very generous support of all the individuals and organizations who are recognized on the back cover of our festival guide and on our website. Um, and now on with the show. This evening's program is called This Place is Thrilling, Why We Set Our Novels Where We Do. And it features four fabulous authors of mysteries and thrillers. Mark Cameron is the author of the New York Times bestselling Jericho Quinn thrillers, the Deputy U.S. Marshal Arliss Cutter crime series, and since 2016, the continued Tom Clancy Jack Ryan campus thriller series. A retired Chief Deputy U.S. Marshal, Cameron holds a second degree black belt in jujitsu and is a law enforcement scuba diver and man tracking instructor. So don't mess with him. He hails from Texas and now lives with his wife in Alaska where at least some of his novels are set, including this one, which is a very recent uh, and exciting one, Bone Rattle. So welcome, Mark Cameron. Thank you. And next we have KJ Howe. She is the executive director of the International Thriller Writers and an internationally best-selling author. She has spent the last six years immersed in the shadowy world of kidnap and ransom to create the Freedom Broker series which showcases elite kidnap negotiator Thea Paris. Howe holds a master's degree in writing popular fiction from Seton Hill University and lives in Toronto, Canada. But her passion is traveling the world in search of adventure. And she does that much like the main character in her series, Thea Paris, who has adventures all over the world in novels like Skyjack. David Heshka, so welcome, Kimberly. David Heshka Wambli Wyden, an enrolled citizen of the Sichungu Lakota Nation, is the author of the novel Winter Counts, nominated for the Edgar Award, Anthony Award, Barry Award, Thriller Award, and the Hammett Prize. The book won the Lefty Award for Best Debut Mystery Novel and the Spur Award for Best Contemporary Novel. And I have to tell you that that is a completely outdated list because I think he has won just about every award there is this year. And there are a lot of awards uh, and they are all for this wonderful book, Winter Counts, which takes place on the Rosebud Reservation right here in South Dakota. Wyden has also written Spotted Tail, a biography for middle graders, and he lives in Denver with his family. So welcome, David. Thank you. 
And last, but certainly not least, because she is leading our conversation tonight, we have Sandra Brannon. Sandra sets some of her heart-pounding Liv Bergen mysteries in the Black Hills of South Dakota, where she lives and works in the family mining business. Her intrepid protagonist has been described as the love child of Sue Grafton's Kinsey Mahone and Lee Child's Jack Reacher. And her books have been called Unput Downable by the Redheaded Blogger and Good and Scary by Library Journal. And one of her uh, more recent from her last series is this book. And it is indeed pretty good and scary, I would say. So welcome, Sandra. And now I will let you take it away and lead the conversation with all of these other esteemed authors. Well, first, let's all thank Jennifer and the South Dakota Book Festival folks that have volunteered and put this on from uh, the South Dakota Humanities. It, this is always fun, and I'm sorry we're not in person. I would have loved to have seen the duo between Mark Cameron and Kimberly on the streets of Deadwood. I wanted to know who Wild Bill was going to shoot. I got shot by Wild Bill, so that's kind of cool to be able to put on my resume. That's not quite as thrilling as David's resume. So, David, I'm going to start with you because I think this is the coolest starting point I've ever seen any author have, even back to Patricia Cornwell. She didn't have this brilliant of a stellar uh, showcase when she came out. And she, she had won a lot of awards at that point. But I agree with Jennifer. She hasn't even started to mention how many how many accolades you got starting in 2020 for Winter Counts. And I also like that Winter Counts actually mattered. The title mattered. And you, you uh, drew our eye to it very quickly in that novel, which I loved. So it's every author's dream to get the recognition you did. But so before we get started on the setting, I have to ask you how you're handling your fame and fortune and time in the spotlight, because this is huge. It's huge what, what you've accomplished in a very short time. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you for those wonderful words. And thank you to the South Dakota Festival and everybody here. It's really my honor and pleasure. The South Dakota Festival has been a big supporter of what I've been trying to do. Spotted Tail, I talked about that uh, last year. And so it's just, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. As far as fame and fortune, I'm not sure that I have either. Thank you so much for the kind words about the awards. It, it was truly an honor. I've been told I'm the first Native American writer to ever be, receive the Anthony Award. Uh, the Lefty, the Berry, the McCavity, and possibly the Thriller as well. And that, that's a real honor, but I want to say that I'm following in the footsteps of some wonderful writers before me. Lewis Owens is one of the most, you know, the greatest uh, uh, crime writers. He's passed on to the spirit world. So I really owe them. And as far as awards and accolades, the greatest honor that I received is a young Lakota woman who lives in South Dakota sent me a video crying saying that she finally feels seen after she read my book. And she said it was the most wonderful feeling that she'd ever had. And really, it's true that that meant more to me than anything. It was just such an honor. So thank you for the nice words. Oh, it's huge. Did you ever imagine the impact you'd have with Winter Count? I, I would be lying if I said I was confident about the success of this book, because first of all, I wasn't sure that anybody was really interested in a literary thriller set on the Rosebud Reservation, number one. Um, and number two, my book came out just two months after the pandemic shut everything down. There wasn't a bookstore in the country open. My entire book tour was canceled. Everything was canceled. So I, I was not feeling great about the whole thing, but word of mouth really took off. and. People really just started responding to the book and and critics came aboard. And so it's it's been a, a, a great ride. And well, I'm, I'm very proud of you and I can see the movie already. And I know you've uh, the secret. I'm going to let it out that you've auctioned some film rights. And we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, but I, I uh, before we get into the other introductions, uh, following it up real quick. But how long did it take you to write this brilliant novel? I know you're a lawyer. Um, I know you've had some major you've, you were uh, an MF. I believe you got an uh, MF in creative writing at the American Indian Institute, if I remember, or the university, if I remember. So you have some mad skills behind this, but how long did it take you to write this novel? Um, Winter Counts took me about 17 months to write. Um, now, you know, of course, the, every author says this, and it's true. It took us a lifetime to synthesize, you know, our experiences. And I think that's true for every author here. My day job is I am a full professor of Native American studies at Metropolitan State University of Denver. I don't really practice law anymore. I donate some time to the Denver Indian Center here. Um, 
but but in terms of just getting you know my seat in the chair and writing, it took a, a, a good 17 months of getting up every morning at 4 a.m. because I have two kids that I'm raising and I'm a single good dad. And so that 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 took some time. So good for you. Well, you're following in to me and Larry McMurtry's uh, footsteps where I think this is you know, just going to be the next lonesome dove of our times, because this, it, I think nobody knows, those of us in South Dakota do know the history behind what's happened here, and it seems to be left out of so many history books, and it's it's impacting, and it's impacting when you live here with one another to see this is this is tragic, and we need to understand what's happened here. So to me, I'm, I'm thrilled, and I, I agree with the woman that called and said she was crying that you finally represented her, because it's been a voice that's been long forgotten or long ignored and it's not going to be anymore so i love this this is it's a it's a big day for me so i'm excited for you so i, I also know that you're at thriller fest and you're a member at thriller fest and kimberly howe is the executive director uh, for thriller fest and in, in the international thriller writers event every year and um i'm excited that my dear friend is on this panel as well so sorry that you guys didn't get to do the shootout I was really looking forward to this, but um, I want to talk about uh, uh, your latest book was Skyjack. The Freedom Broker was probably one of the most impacting novel I read because just as David broke through some ceilings, in my opinion, not that there weren't Lakotans even writing before he, he came around, um, but there were women writing before you came around, Kimberly. But I think you broke through that thriller ceiling when my Vietnam veteran Purple Heart husband is finally saying, yes, women can finally write thrillers as well as men do. Way to go. He never even read mine. So good job. You've got him reading women's thrillers now. So fabulous. So uh, what I want to uh, talk about that, that Jennifer didn't talk about is you were a globetrotter as a youth. So is that what inspired you to have Thea be a globetrotter? Sure. So just to give people a little idea of the background, my father worked in telecommunications. So we lived abroad most of my life growing up. We lived in Africa, Puerto Rico, Saudi Arabia, Europe, and I thoroughly enjoyed uh, the experience. But it was tough because I was always a new kid in school. So I would switch schools even mid-year, which I'm sure you can all understand, was pretty tough. And books were really my friends. They were the one constant in my life. And I remember reading um, David Morrell's Brotherhood of the Rose. And I was so enraptured by that, like his set of spy thrillers. I said to myself, if I could ever write something that would transport someone else to a place of escapism, then I would be the happiest person on earth. So I'm, I'm very grateful that I was able to write a, a novel that you know, was in that kind of vein. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. And I hope people, I hope after today, tonight, if they haven't read your books, they all buy all three of your books because they're fabulous. And the fun part for me on this panel is I have read everybody's books, including Spotted Tail, except for Winter Counts. When Jennifer said, would you do this panel? And I'm like, oh, I know all three authors. Oh, yes, I would love to do this. And so I'm a big fan of Mark and Kimberly's and now a huge fan of David's too. So Mark is another dear friend that I met at Thriller Fest, um, which is fabulous. He is the most experienced author on this panel. Um, I, I bow to the master here. Uh, he has his fifth Tom Clancy coming out in a month, in November, which I can't wait. This is going to be exciting. He's got eight Jericho Quinn, which our whole family, our Jericho Quinn fans, we're just like bow to the master. I happen to like Arliss Cutter even better because I think he reminds me more of Mark Cameron than any of your other characters. So I love Arliss. Uh, but I want to talk about, I, oh, by the way, you, I sorry you missed your U.S. Marshals Conference. What's really cool about you is I can't believe you were the featured speaker for the U.S. Marshals Conference nationally. And I was going to go in with a rubber nose and a mustache and pretend <laughs> to be a U.S. Marshal and go, oh, I like that guy. Anyway, <laughs> So I was there, ready, but you weren't there. So I apologize for missing you. So you've been in law enforcement for 30 years, 30 long years, I'm sure. So tell us how that that uh, transpired and led you into career for writing. I'm kind of kind of curious about what made you pick up the pen. I, I wanted to be a writer before I wanted to be a, a police officer. I, I In fact, I told my wife we were in college. I, I met her in the theater department. We were in plays together and um, I told her then that I want to be a college professor and write novels. And then, so she agreed to marry me. And then I was in Texas. She was in Calgary, Alberta. And we were, you know, talking together by, 
by phone and, and letter. And um, I finally decided I better come clean with her and tell her that I wanted to be a cop too. And uh, she married me anyway. And then, um, so I just, I, you know, I was writing stories already and turning them in, getting rejection notices. Back, back then I was writing more short stories and essays, wrote a ton of short stories for just about anybody that would publish short stories. Red, red book, you know, a lot of the women's publications were publishing short stories, but got a ton of uh, rejections and finally got published by Boys Life and uh, Saturday Evening Post and then uh, ultimately published or wrote Westerns because I thought that would be easy to break into. It wasn't, but it, I got plenty of rejections that way. But I think the the whole law enforcement thing, I tell every, in fact, I'm doing a panel on it tomorrow with uh, Jim Reese um, about cops and criminals and really the law enforcement and writing is the people business settings are great and they they certainly are a great tapestry and a backdrop and that's what we're talking about today but it's how our characters unfold themselves amid these settings and being a cop i mean my youngest is a police officer now and almost every day when he's driving home from work he'll call me and he'll say he starts off the conversations by saying dad people and sometimes it's it's oh yay people but most of the time it's oh my gosh can you believe what people are like but that's that's like crime writing thriller writer or really any kind of writing 101 to just study those people yeah i agree and setting is important and that's what we're talking about but all three of you do a great job developing characters beyond recognition and i can't I agree with you, Mark. I, I have to, some of my questions at the end are about your villains and your protagonists, but uh, so in, I'll get the settings right now, but but then I want to get to your characters because you're so good at characters. All three of you are great at characters. So first, Kimberly, ladies first, Skyjack, most creative setting you could ever have. The entire <laughs> book is on the plane, right? So, so what made you go from globetrotting and the Freedom Broker, which was all over the planet, you know, Africa being pretty central to that that theme but to be on a plane tell me what that transition was like changing that setting sure so um i think you know there's there's a lack of control when you're on a plane obviously unless you're the pilot and um most of us when we get on that that is why there's such a fear of flying you know people drive every day and it's much much more dangerous to drive than it is to fly but there's something about being on a plane and I did a deep dive into, you know, basically business jets and, and, you know, all sorts of different planes so that I could write with authenticity about it. And, you know, it's fascinating because 9-11 changed absolutely everything. It used to be um, that um, you could basically in some ways break into the cockpit, but they wanted to stop that from happening. So they made a lot of changes, you know, some of which are uh, obviously public knowledge, some which aren't. Um, to make sure that the pilots could also, you know, brace themselves and, and, and put themselves behind the cockpit. But the question I have for you guys is what happens if the bad person is already in the pilot seat? And that's something I had, you know, played around with. So if you read Skyjack, you will definitely learn how to break into a cockpit, which you never know could come in handy. <laughs> That's exactly right. Well, it was a frightening, frightening book. And it, I, if you would have told me it would have all happened on a plane, I'm like, I don't know that that could be done. And it was convincing. It was very well done in that setting. Uh, so I thought you did a brilliant job on that. Uh, David, again, you know, the, uh, just you're setting on Rosebud. I've been to Rosebud so many times and the people there are just beautiful people. And I thought you showcased that well, but you all, I also lived in Fort Collins and you're in Denver. My gosh, Colfax has changed. Thank you very much for, for sharing what has changed with that marijuana coming in. It's just the, the whole community has changed in Denver, um, which, which I don't, you know, I, I want to hear about how, how Virg, Virgil Wounded Horse, um, how you, to me, developed those two settings around him because he seems, um, it tentative to go to Denver, tentative to go to other places, but wanting to. And so the setting drives the character in, in your books, which I think is wonderful. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about the setting of uh, Winter Counts, which is 
most of the book, The Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota, but three chapters in Denver. For those that don't know, the book is the story of Virgil Wounded Horse, who is a hired vigilante on the Rosebud Reservation. There is an outrageous law passed by the U.S. Congress back in 1885, the Major Crimes Act, which forbids Native nations from prosecuting felony crimes on their own lands. They must call in the FBI U.S. Attorney's Office to, have to prosecute these felonies. I recently published an essay on this a year ago in the New York Times, uh, not fiction, an actual essay. But, but the U.S. Attorney's Office and FBI are declining to prosecute about 40% of all felony crimes, resulting in offenders being released. So you will have vigilantes then, um, unfortunately, or unfortunately, I suppose, um, having to take up the slack and get justice for those who can't get it. So Winter Counts is the story of a vigilante on the Rosebud Reservation. Now, the setting of the book is the reservation, and I had a lot of stress about that because I recognize that most of my readers probably have never visited a native reservation, and they, they don't have any idea. In fact, there are a lot of people in South Dakota that probably, maybe they've driven through Pine Ridge on the highway, but you know they may not have gone to Rosebud and, I, and there were a lot of people that I think didn't know what a reservation is like. So I felt a real responsibility to portray res what a reservation is like accurately, but also positively. It would be dishonest for me not to note that we have terrible poverty on our reservation. About a third of our houses don't have electricity or running water. Many of our houses are boarded up because they've been used as meth labs. You know, they've been used to cook meth houses. Um, It'd be dishonest for me to turn my head away from that. So I wanted to portray it, but I also wanted to portray the humor, the joy, the resilience of the Lakota people. So I, I walked, I, I hoped a, a tightrope <laughs> to try and do that in an accurate way. The chapters in Denver were a joy to write because I was born here and uh, Colorado has changed massively <laughs> over the last few years. And so it was a lot of fun to have uh, Virgil travel to Denver and go into a marijuana shop where he's just absolutely stunned by you know what we have here. So those were the most fun chapters for me to write, the Denver chapters. Anyway, so thank you for that question. Well, that's interesting because it, it did it that it opened my eyes more to what's changed in Denver. And I thought that was really interesting. So for the rest of the world, it was probably interesting to hear about South Dakota. So you did a great job. And and I do, you know, for those of us that have read it, it really, you know, the vigilante, okay, yep. Your your all of your posts the 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 people that are saying yeah that was overdone always and it's like but for once David Hesse actually made it fresh new and perfect so it was like we all want a vigilante even if if it's done over and over and over by authors you finally did it in a very fresh way and it was that's what I was excited about so I, I think you took something that was was. We all like vigilantes. Sorry, Mark. I know you're in law enforcement, but we do all cheer on those vigilantes, right? Sorry, we do. So uh, it it is what it is. But anyway, I thought you did a great job there. Um, so so Mark, I'm going to get into uh, for me, Arliss Cutter is very much like C.J. Box's uh, Joe Pickett. For those fans out there of Joe Pickett, um, and and I I have to I'm so C.J. Box and Craig Johnson have attended the South Dakota Book Festival many times. So for those Craig Johnson fans who love the Hector Lives and Henry Sandy Bear um, emulating uh, Hector Lives, that's Virgil Wounded Horse. So so you guys need to tune into Mark and David's books, those of you that like uh, CJ Box and Craig Johnson, because they're, they're great uh, new characters in this area. But we love superheroes. So um, I'm just realizing now that, you know, how much I love people like Virgil and Theo, Thea and uh, Jericho Quinn, but Arliss, tell me how, how you got, came to be from the Ryan novels to the Jericho Quinn novels, which are both internationally set, and then you moved to Alaska. I want to see how you're setting, you went from the national, international stage to Alaska with Arliss Cutter, and it's brilliant writing. So how did you have to change your mindset to change the settings? Uh, you know, Sandra, that's a great question. And the actually the Arliss, the first Arliss Cutter novel was written first. It was written in a different form when I was just learning how to write years and years ago. I, as when the Marshal Service, I was part of the uh, tactical tracking unit for the District of Alaska. So, you know, Marshals, 
use all kinds of sophisticated technology and computers and phones and all that, but to track quote unquote bad guys are fugitives. But oftentimes it boils down to simply tracking people over the ground. And I've been an outdoorsman all my life. And, and uh, we had an actual tracking instructor in Alaska and he formed this team. So early on, I was sent down to track a person that chopped another guy's head off with a splitting mall and fled into the woods. And I was down on this island of Prince of Wales, which is down by Ketchikan, Alaska, about 800, 700, 800 miles south of here. And we spent three days tracking him through the woods. And this is, Prince of Wales Island is much like, it's the Alaska's version of Haida Gwaii. It's Haida people and Clinket people. So that Southeast totem pole building, just incredible cultures. And it's steeped in that kind of culture, old growth forests and all of that. And so I, I, this was 23 years ago, 22 years ago. And so I wrote a novel and I sent it my, I was already writing Westerns. I sent it off. Uh, I thought, okay, I've got six Westerns under my belt. Some of them under, you know, ghostwritten for another writer, <clears throat> but this ought to be a cinch. Nobody wanted it. And I wrote another one, tried to fix it. And my agent called me back and said, you got a really nice, you got a really nice, rejection letter. I'm going to send it to you. And it was like a page and a half long. And you, got, you guys that have gotten rejection letters know generally they're a line. If you even get one on a piece of paper now, used to, it might flutter out like confetti out of the envelope saying, you know, not for us at this time. But so this was very effusive about my writing style, but, and I, I don't want to say who it was, but it was one of the big publishers. But the editor said, we like the way you write, but you, with your job, you need to think over the top. You need to think big. You need to think international. Get, and then he closed off with two lines that really changed the trajectory of my writing. He said, and anyway, oh, and my protagonists were Alaska Native kids. He said, who cares about Alaska? And who cares about a bunch of Alaska Native kids? And I, wow. got, I got pretty upset. And so I went and in a fit of peak wrote the first Jericho Quinn novel and sent it off and got caught up. And I like those they are great, you know, fun to write those. But then when I finally, it was a moment in time. And those are people that write for a living and are trying to get published know that there's this meshing that sometimes happen where you could have the greatest novel in the world. And if there's not an editor that somehow is there to grab it at the right time, that happens to like it enough to champion it. And I was able to be successful enough with the Jerichos that we were moving into the cutters. I was, I was in Florida researching the first Arliss Cutter novel as I was changing it from my original when I got the call on the Clancy's. So it all sort of happened at the same time. People who don't know the Arliss Cutter series, Open Carry was first, uh, then Stone Cross, and then Bone Cutter. And they're all very well done to show the interaction between um, the the people of Alaska and the natives in Alaska and and Bone Cutter his latest novel is brilliant on people trying to desecrate uh, the native traditions and he handles it brilliantly uh, I mean Arliss Cutter handles it brilliantly and I just that it, it makes you he he's that vigilante even though he's in law enforcement so uh, that's what I love about vigilanteism so it's yeah, like thanks. it's just the unfairness that's constantly done to people that that it's just not fair. So I think you did a great job on that too, Mark. So I'm going to open it up to all three of you and I'm going to ask just a couple more questions because I want to open it up for questions from the audience. But let me ask each of you, uh, where is your choice setting when you go about, if you went about developing a story that would be so unpredictable, what setting would you choose? I just talk, so I'll yield. I'll go left. <laughs> He's yielding the floor to either David or Kimberly. I'll go last. So I guess I'll, I'll jump in if you want. Um, I would definitely pick Africa. Um, I spent three years living in Kenya. I've been back many, many times. It is an absolutely magical place. <coughs> I think that there are so many different um, topographies and opportunities and, you know, there's also like such wealth there, but yet such poverty. And it's just fascinating to me. I think it would be a great, great setting, you know, for a phenomenal thriller. And it's sort of in my blood. And whenever I go back, 
And um, when people hear that I used to live there, they always tell me welcome home. And that really warms my heart. Yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. David? I, I suppose if I were to write an unpredictable, you know, choose an unpredictable setting, sticking with Virgil Wounded Horse, who's the character that I'm currently writing about right now, I'm writing the sequel to Winter Counts. You know, I would love for Virgil to visit a part of the country that he's never been to. I don't know how Virgil would take to say New York City, where I lived for a little bit, you know. Um, I would just love to see how he would how he would function there. I'm not sure that he would have the money to go to Africa or Australia or something like that, but he might be able to make it out to New York. And that would be that would be a hoot to write. But uh, for the for the next book, he's gonna stay pretty centered in South Dakota, not not even going to Denver. <laughs> Well, Jack Reacher came to South Dakota, Lee Child's Jack Reacher, and, and Virgil reminds me so much of Jack Reacher in so many ways that he's so lovable. I hope he does go out to the rest of the country and find different places where he can he can be an enforcer for other towns. So I love that. All right, Mark, you, now you've had time to think about your setting. Well, it's a hard, that's a hard question because I'm setting, I love Alaska. We've lived here over 23 years and I, there's so much of Alaska to to kind of bop around in and move around in that I, and so many different cultures and the books, you know, I try to keep them not, you know, not make them formulaic, but he's in a different spot with a little bit different crime with a kind of with a backdrop of a different native culture to, to showcase. Sometimes it's setting, sometimes it's the, the secondary main character, the main, you know, one of the main protagonists for that book. But, um, my wife and I spend, absent COVID, we spend a couple of months every year in the South Pacific on the island of Rarotonga. And Arliss's partner, Lola Te Ariki, is Maori. She's Cook Island Maori. And so I've really gotten to love the people there. And I would, I, at some point, I, they have this thing when a, when a young man comes of age, sometimes it's when he's five, sometimes he's a little bit older, they have a big hair cutting ceremony. It was they back in the day they would keep their hair long so that the they could be hidden as girls and not be sent off to be warriors, you know, when the chiefs would come along. And so I would like to have Arliss, I mean, he's already kind of a fish out of water coming from Florida to Alaska. I would like to have him as Lola's good friend and sort of uncle figure go to the Cook Islands and the South Pacific and have some sort of mystery there. Okay, so I'm gonna jump right in there. So do you feel like a fish out of water coming from Texas to Alaska? I'm you know, curious. I did, I did at first, when I, when I first got here, um, I rode the prisoner plane up. I transferred up before my wife and family came up and I lived with another deputy who's a good friend of mine. And we, I paid my own way to move up here. And so I hopped a, I basically thumbed a ride on what we call JPATS, the what everybody else calls Con Air, the Justice Prisoner Alien Transportation Plane. So I flew in, got picked up, and immediately, I mean, it was April, but there was still snow on the ground, and the light was incredible. It was light till way late at night, and the mosquitoes were like aircraft carrier size. And so I, I think I, I'm used to it now, but um, yeah, it was there was a lot of, you know, simple things like sitting surveillance in the winter until you've done it once, and you realize the whole inside of your car frosts up. You know, folks from South Dakota know that, but in Texas, <laughs> I didn't deal a lot with that setting surveillance. So yeah, it, you learn, there's what? a lot of learning. And moose, we have moose run by us when we're standing out watching a house, bear. Yeah, bear would scare me. Moose are huge. So we don't have that in South Dakota, <laughs> not very often. So, so Mark, I'm going to jump right into protagonist with you. I love, love. So sticking with Arliss uh, Cutter and uh, Lola. And but, you know, my favorite character is not even on the page. It's Grumpy. So I have to ask you about Grumpy. Please tell the world about Grumpy and his rules. It, that is a brilliant way to bring somebody in that's no longer with us. Thought so, it was very well done. So in the net, in the book that comes out, it's already written a book, fourth book called Cold Snap. We have a flashback that introduces Grumpy and Grumpy is the the paternal Arliss and his brother's paternal grandfather he raised the boys when they were his Arliss's mother ran away or their father died and Grumpy is a Florida Marine Patrol officer that was a you know officer back in the 80s and early 90s and um, raised the boys to be good solid men and um, not scared in fact he calls them their 
their man rules, even though they, you know, Arliss's sister-in-law points out that they translate to just good people, but Grumpy was raising these two boys on his own as a sometimes the absentee, you know, law enforcement officer. But the long and short of it is he, he never smiles very much, even when he's happy. Um, if I, it, you know, a lot of people say, are you Arliss in the book? And no, I'm Grumpy. That's me. <laughs> That's who I'd aspire to be. I thought he was cool. And you, you depicted teenagers really well. David, so did you. You're a teenager. I love Nathan, and I love the high school scenes, and I think those are very hard to write, and I've been criticized for the way I write teenagers, uh, but I thought you did a really good job with Nathan. Uh, so are, I have to ask, are your, your kids in that age group, or are they younger? Oh, thank you so much. Um, so in, the, in, the, in Winter Counts, Nathan is Virgil's uh, nephew, uh, but Virgil is his legal guardian because uh, Nathan's parents are, are dead. And um, and in the book, uh, Nathan is 14. When I wrote the book, my son, David Jr. was uh, 13. So every, everybody in the book is made up with the exception of Nathan, who I largely based off of my son, David Jr. Now, ironically, my son, David Jr. has not read the book, which breaks my heart. I'm like, dude, you're in it. OK, will you read it? He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, he, he's a video game guy. And so, you know, I don't know what to do. But yes, yes, yes. I, I took a lot of things directly from David. There's a, a scene in there where some backstory where somebody, a, a, a little girl wears wolf ears and howls in class. David told me that story. It happened in his school, you know. So, um, yeah, so so I, I borrowed almost completely from my son. That That's the one. So I think that's the only reason there's any aura of truthfulness about it. Well, if, if if it's any consolation, I don't think Nathan, I don't think Nathan would have read your book either. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't have read it either. I thought you depicted it really well. And Kimberly, I've I've got to tell you, I loved Thea, Christos, and Nico's relationship. I love I love their 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 mm, they're protagonists, but they're not good people in some cases. So it was like, I loved how you developed why weren't they good or what, why did they have problems? But dear protagonists were wonderful in Freedom Broker. And then I, I want more of them in Skyjack, if that makes sense. So I hope there's a future novel on Nikos. So I don't care what you say. I want that. Spoiler alert. So tell us how you got the family dynamics, because I, you know, that I told you once that the family business side of it comes with great pleasures and great problems. And those protagonists did a great job depicting what it's like to be in a family business. That's my opinion. Well, thanks a lot, Sandra. I mean, how many people here have the perfect family? <laughs> Raise your hands, right? Um, so I decided to really delve into family dynamics because I find it fascinating. And when Thea was only eight years old, she watched as her brother was kidnapped. And actually it was in her place because she was supposed to be in her bed, but she wasn't. And that developed, you know, her brother Nikos um, was kidnapped and, and he became a child soldier. And by the time he returned, he changed forever. And the father also was had a part, you know, in, in the, with respect to the kidnapping. So I think that that kind of crisis and major issue in her childhood shaped, well, I mean, shaped all of the family members in the different ways. And I think basically revisiting that when they're all adults and Thea has a lot of survivor's guilt, even though her brother survived, certainly he was changed forever by that you know, horrific experience. And so, you know, revisiting that when they're all adults was, I think, a fascinating journey into family dynamics. Yeah. Yeah. Not talking about it until then. It, it's, it was very well done. So my last question for all three of you, and I'll start with Kimberly, uh, your favorite, because I, your favorite villain you've been able to write about. So, uh, so far, so Kimberly, you, yours and mine has to be the same on my favorite of your villains, but what, what, what was your favorite villain to write? I think it would be Nikos, I'm hoping you agree, yes. Um, I received a lot of reader emails about Nikos, that's the brother um, of Thea. Yep. And you know, I think it was just so interesting to write a complicated character who is really, really bad, but you empathize with him because of his childhood and what he went through. So you're kind of, I love anti-heroes, like anyone here like Dexter, you know, he has a code, right? And I always believe that the stronger your villain in the book, the better the novel. 
And you also want to make them complicated. And in his or her mind, the villain should be the hero of their own story, which I think really resonates on the page when you think, wait a second, I'm kind of cheering for this guy now. What happened? Uh, yeah, you shouldn't be cheering for villains, but all three of yours, I love to hate your villains and I hate to love your villains because I love them as much as I hate them. And I think that's brilliant writing. So I agree with you, Kimberly. So I'm going to ask David, who's the favorite villain in Winter Counts? I want to see if mine matches yours. And by the way, Nikos is the best villain. Anyway, so David, who's who's your favorite villain in your books? Well, I, I the one that I'll talk about, I don't want to give away too many spoilers here, but the obvious villain is a character called Rick Crow. So Rick Crow is a, a guy who has beaten up my protagonist when he was younger, and he's helping to bring hard drugs to the reservation, which Virgil is trying to stop. And, and when I wrote early drafts of this novel, I realized that Rick Crow was a little too one-dimensional. And so like, like uh, uh, Kim said, you, know, you, you need to humanize and, and give as much fullness and roundness to your villains as you can. So I added some scenes where Virgil actually finds Rick Crow's father. And there's a monologue in the book where the yeah. father says and explains how Rick Crow came to be so warped. And, and so I, in fact, just today, I, I taped a little lecture for the Crime Bake Conference, which is coming up in a few months on writing effective villains. So I wrote, I taped a, I, I taped a little lecture for writing effective villains. And this is one of my tips that I gave, which I'll give now here as well. Make your villains a dark mirror of your protagonist. That's what I told the students there, you know, take the qualities in your protagonist that you like and see if you can reflect them, but in a negative way in your in your antagonist, in your villain. And so I, I loved writing uh, Rick Crow and thinking about his backstory and trying to give, you know, a little more humanity to him. So I'll stop there. Well, I, you know, I love Marie Short Bear's mom. I thought she was a great villain. And she wasn't the villain. I, I mean, that's not a spoiler alert. It's just, she was really hard for me to like. You know, she was a mother, but I was thinking, oh, I hope I'm not that kind of parent. I hope I'm not that kind of parent. But I thought that was a great villain, and it's probably not one you expected, but I like that villain. Thank you. So, okay, so Mark, yours are, you have villain after villain after villain that dies and dies and dies and dies. A lot of villains in your book. And the, I think your villains make your protagonist grow, no matter which protagonist you pick, if it's Jack Ryan, Jericho Quinn, or Arliss Kip Cutter. But who is the favorite villain you ever wrote in any of those novels? Well, first, I think what David said about that mirror, that darker mirror, that's that's brilliant advice. Everybody that's listening to this that wants to write should, should take note of that. Um, you know, many of my early villains were inspired by my daughter's boyfriends. They died in terrible, terrible ways. Um, I really like her husband. He's a good guy, and he ends up in, in, in as a good guy in the new Jack Ryan. But um, my favorite villain, I think, I don't know. I, I think probably my favorite to write. When I you were talking about being a fish out of water, when I first transferred to Alaska. Uh, we were in a, we were after a particular fugitive in downtown Anchorage and he ran, we had him sort of boxed in and I was on the corner where I didn't have eyes on him, but I was closest if you understand that. So he ran into this particular bar that's kind of a labyrinth. It's just a labyrinth of, in fact, if you, if you look on Yelp for this bar, one of the first reviews is people have died there. This is an awesome place. So it's this labyrinth of different rooms and and rooms that have motifs. And so I'm chucking through the, you know, swinging the doors open. It was like, uh, it's one of the stories that probably got my son into law enforcement. But so I, I'm running through these different, you know, pushing people aside and I see a door and I hear a hum behind it. And you, you just don't go through doors blindly. You don't know what's on the other side, but I was dumb and, you know, ran through the, so I flung open this door. And as I came into the room, there was this girl in, underwear panties and a bra and she her hands are out in front of her like this and she's doing this to me unbeknownst I don't understand until I, I kind of see what's going on she's got two halibut hooks in her back this flesh of her back and there's another girl opposite her and they're having a hook pull where they they're trying to to see who can pull the other one across this line in the floor and she looks at me and sort of does this like help me win and I'm like <laughs> you know, not in a million years and took out after my guy. Well, that's so burned into my brain, even now. I don't know her name, but I patterned an entire villain named Lourdes after her and I think my third Jericho Quinn book. And that's the way the, 
the main villain, if you will, meets Lourdes is during a hook pull like that. And, you know, oh, I, I think I patterned her, the character after several other female outlaws that we've chased, but her look is almost exactly that gal that I ran face to face into in the in Chilkoot's Charlie's. Uh, awesome. I, I love this. I just love it. We do have a question for Mark right off the bat. How did you get an agent? I want to make sure I'm leaving time for questions, but how did you get your agent? You're with Kensington, right? Correct. And, yeah. So my, my agent is really Robin. Great publishing. Yeah, they're very good. They've been very good for me. The um, My agent's Robin Rue, and I, I actually pitched a novel at uh, Western Writers Association, uh, that conference, Western Writers of America, and an editor from Kensington um, asked for chapters. I went home, polished up my chapters, um, sent them off. She called and um, asked to ask me to ghostwrite for another author, and that she would eventually get my book, you know, get my book on the slate on the publication schedule. I didn't have an agent. But uh, she said, I'm going to send you some books and then you call me. And so I read the books over that she wanted me to go straight for. And I called and she had been let go. And so I oh, asked no. the people, at, I said, well, wait, wait, so-and-so is, she's, she's got this deal with me. And they said, we don't know what you're talking about. That's between you and her. Goodbye. And then yeah. I got an email and un, in the background, this editor had given my pages to Robin. Robin liked what she saw and called me and said, I'd like to represent you. And that's been 18 years ago. So I was, I was very fortunate because Robin is a phenomenal, phenomenal agent. She's been, yeah. and become a great friend. So I, you know, you're, it's that same thing I was talking about before with that kind of meshing of, you have to do all your homework, do all this stuff. And then when the right situation comes along, then it, it can work out. And be patient, exactly, be patient. Right. Any other questions out there? You can unmute your microphones now. You can type it in the chat, whichever you'd rather. And if you wanna ask, that'd be great. I'll give you a few seconds here, but while I'm waiting, I'm just gonna ask one last question of these guys. And that is, what's next? So who wants to answer what's next? I know, Mark, for you, you have a Tom Clancy coming out in November and you have an Arliss Cutter coming out in April. I'm waiting for the April one. When is your, are you, do you have a Jericho Quinn on the books I'm, or no? I'm working on a Jericho Quinn novella right now. And then okay. another Arliss. In fact, I just took a, we're talking about setting here. I, I think David actually said you spend a lifetime, you know, researching these books and then you sort of put it into play as you write. I've lived here 20, three years, but I just, uh, my wife and I took a train trip up to Fairbanks and back to research uh, the next Arliss. And then while I was chatting with some people there, there's always those unknown unknowns, the things you don't know to ask that you find out. Um, one of the porters on the plane, the train said, hey, you really ought to check out this area, but they're not running trains there now. And so I, I hired a friend of mine to fly me up one of the valleys here to these, these incredible hidden valley with with tunnels through and the mountains and and deep canyons and white water and that'll be the next cutter i'm pretty excited about that very cinematic i can't wait i can't wait uh, everybody go out and get a jericho quinn novel an arliss cutter novel or Thank any you. of the tom clancy's he's written he's got the fifth ones coming out in november so uh i strongly recommend uh, starting with any of them and they're Thank fabulous you. it'll make you go back and read everything Thank so you. um so uh kimberly and yes. gail i'm going to introduce you to kimberly gail asked the question about agent Gail, you need to meet Kimberly Howe because she has Thriller Fest and has Pick Fest at our event where you can meet any editors and agents you want there. And it's a fabulous event. Uh, so for all of you writers out there that are listening, Kimberly, what's next for you? Uh, do you have a third Thea Paris coming out? Um, actually, I have a short story coming out in the Suspense Magazine anthology that focuses on Thea Paris. But I've also, um, during my, you know, I've, like I said, I've been intensively researching kidnapping. And if anyone's interested in kidnapping and travel safety, I'm going to talk tomorrow on that. Um, but during my research, I came across this gentleman on LinkedIn, of all things, I mean, he should be on, you know, one of those ads, um, who is basically what they call a host hostile environment consultant. 
Fascinating title, right? And what he does is he travels with journalists, executives, ambassadors, oil, you know, people in the oil and gas field, as well as celebrities. Um, he's worked with Anthony Bourdain, um, Geraldo, and a host of, you know, BBC, CNN. And so I based a character loosely on my friend. And he basically goes across the world, guarding people and taking him to the worst places on earth. And in the, the next book, The Perfect Hostage, Killian is his name, takes a group of journalists into Jordan and Syria um, to get a great story. And, and, and they were all kidnapped together. So instead oh. of protecting, he is one of the hostages. Nice. Wow, that's gonna be brilliant. That's a great premise. That's a really good idea. Good job. Well, we'll see you soon, I hope. And David, how about you? What's next for you? Well, as I mentioned before, I've, uh, I'm working on the next Virgil Wounded Horse book. I'm in the middle of it. But let me mention, if people enjoy Virgil Wounded Horse, I do have a couple of short stories featuring Virgil, one of which is out right now. Uh, I'm in the Boucher Khan anthology, which is called This Time For Sure. Uh, that has been released, and it was originally a hardback, but you can now get a paperback and a, a Kindle. It's called This Time For Sure. I think uh, Down and Out Books is putting it out. That's got a, a Virgil story in it. And I have another Virgil story coming out in November, so just about uh, five weeks away, in an anthology called Midnight Hour. And I think Crooked Lane is putting that out. And that was a, a really fun story to write called Skin. And um, that is a story where Virgil Wounded Horse is hired to take a book from steal a book which has been bound in the flesh of a murdered native person so the book is actually bound in the tanned flesh of a murdered native person from 100 years ago this is a real incident that happened here in colorado at a at a, a, a school called the isla theological seminary so it's based on a real thing so i've got two virtual stories coming out and um, a, a couple other short stories that are, that are a little bit further down the road. I've got a story in Denver Noir from the Akashic uh, series. And HarperCollins has a worldwide anthology coming out called The Usual Suspects. And I've got another story set in South Dakota coming out there. And then finally, I've got a really exciting anthology that I'll be editing that I can't mention yet. But I promise you, it's going to be of interest to uh, folks in South Dakota. So there's a lot of, a lot of cool stuff happening. Awesome. We can't wait. We can't wait. So we have another question for all of you. And it is, um, which, which author do you most admire? And why? Or enjoy? Most admire or enjoy? So, all right, who wants to start with that one? Well, you mentioned Lewis Owens, right? So, so tell us a little bit about him. I would, I'm curious, because now I want to pick up his book. So I'm happy to talk about Lewis Owens. Lewis, Open, Lewis Owens, I've argued in a couple of articles that I've written, is really, I believe, the father of Native American crime fiction. There have been a couple of authors before Lewis Owens, uh, George Todd Downing, that wrote some crime fiction who were who, who are Native American. But I believe that he really pioneered a uniquely indigenous style and content. And I've written about this in The Strand and on Crime Reads. And, and his, his books, he's gone now, sad to say, but uh, a bone game uh, is is really an important book. I should mention though that Martin Cruz Smith is also a really important. Martin Cruz Smith is indigenous, and he has a thriller right. out, the first native thriller ever, ever called Nightwing. And so, in some ways, he's really the father of 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 native uh, crime fiction as well. And then I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that Larry McMurtry is one of my favorite authors. And when I won the Spur Award for Best Contemporary Contemporary Novel, I dedicated it to Larry McMurtry this year. He won it in 85. And that, you know, his what he did with genre, the way that he really elevated genre, and to show that, you know, genre work is is literary. There's really no distinction between the two. Lonesome Dove was a, in my view, a monumental masterpiece. And so I was really honored to dedicate my award to him this year. Well, I didn't know that when I compared you to the, your 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 coming out much like Larry McMurtry because I I see the parallels there. I definitely saw that, so I did not know that. That's interesting to me. Way to go, David. That's amazing. All right, we. How about you, Kimberly? Yes. So I mean, there's so many, and, and because of my connection with Thriller Fest, I've gotten to know so many talented authors. Unbelievable. It's really hard to pick one, but I will say that I'm a huge fan of Karen Slaughter. 
And I, I really enjoy her World Trend series as well as her standalones. I think she is one of those authors that you consistently know is going to provide a phenomenal read. Um, she does her research. Um, she has an incredible sort of sassy voice. And, you know, like I said, it's always a guaranteed good read. And I have a lot to thank Karen for as well, because someone else earlier, how Mark got his agent and, and how I got my agent was actually through Karen, because I wow. studied at a, at a retreat in Hawaii, of all places, um, and was just, you know, basically uh, trying to learn, spend a, an intensive week learning writing. And during that, Karen was the, one of the teachers. Um, we had a one-on-one -on -one session and Karen said, to me, I think my agent might like your work. Would, would it be okay if I introduce you to her? And so that was a pretty special moment for me and I'll always be grateful. Yeah, and just so all of you uh, uh, fans out there are listening, Karen Slaughter actually came to the South Dakota Book Festival, Jennifer, in 2018 or 16? I, I think feel it like it might've been even 14, but it could have been 16. Oh. Am I that old? Oh my gosh, that no. they do. Okay. <laughs> well, she's a, she's a big fan of the South Dakota Book Festival as well. So she's a wonderful person as well. How about you, Mark? Who, who has influenced you or who do you most admire? Boy, you know, Larry McMurtry, of course. Um, but, I, you know, because I write so, so many different books a year, I read a lot of nonfiction and I read my friends' books, but. Um, I don't want to mention any of them over anybody else. I'm a, I'm a big Eric Larson fan. I read anything that he, he, uh, I, I just finished the one about Churchill. I can't remember the name of it now. Um, Splendid in the Vile, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Splendid in the Vile. That's, that, that's one of my favorite books uh, ever. I grew up um, reading Robert Penn Warren and uh, Ken Follett. I have all Ken Follett's books and I have them underlined you know how he starts books i had um uh, i can't remember and then you he's, he's probably one of my favorite authors and i can't remember his last name now he was the co-author with nordhoff of mutiny on the bounty james anyway the guy i can't think of his name is one of my favorite authors he wrote a he wrote a short story called sing a song of sixpence that's my favorite writing at all any everywhere so um yeah, that guy, Jim, well, I, Jim, Jim something. <laughs> I, I don't know that name. I will tell you, uh, Jennifer, I will tell you, Jennifer, because Jennifer asked this question. David, you are by far my best new author that I have. That's my favorite right now. Kimberly, I've told you you're one of my favorite authors that have broken through the ceiling for most of us women that write thrillers. And Mark, before I even knew you, I said this is probably one of the best contemporary thriller authors on the planet, and and well, it, it, that was uh, that was before I knew who you were, and you're a great guy on top of that. But I, you know, I love you right. I just want to jump in here, Sandra, because we you've asked us a bunch of questions, you've talked about us, but I got to <laughs> tell you, when I stepped up to that table on Thriller Fest my very first time, you were like the the ambassador to everyone else there. You introduced me to to Kimberly. You. Uh, You've just been a great friend and you're a tremendous you. writer in your own right as well. So don't uh, sell yeah. yourself short. So Mark, you know, the first thing you ever said to me was, who are you? Because I kept saying, now you want to watch this person. Now here's the <laughs> guy know, that's coming down the street. I know. You just went, who are you? Well, and I'm well, like, nobody. You, nobody. I'm from South Dakota. <laughs> who, can some, who can introduce somebody to David Morrell? Like, oh yeah, come over here, David, and talk to this guy. That's that's pretty uh, pretty impressive, Sandra. You know, speaking of David Morrell, obviously David has lost uh, a, a child, and so have I. And David, I, I'm telling you this, David Morrell told me to watch Wind River, and I've heard comparisons of your writing to that Wind River movie. And and uh, that, so that that's a huge compliment from your fans oh, yeah. that are writing about you. I can't believe, I mean, I would take that, David, because David Morrell uh, turned me on to that movie, and I love that movie. I good think that's movie. a fabulous really movie. movie. Anyway, you. I digress, but you guys are amazing. I've had so much fun talking with you. I loved reading your books. I always do, and I can't wait to see what's next. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra. Thank yes. you so much, everyone. Thank you, you Sandra, and thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, 
I, we had a thrilling conversation. It was great to host you all. And I hope to have you back in person sometime. And I, I want to say thanks to the audiences and to all of you. There's so much more still to come. We've got a full day tomorrow starting at 11 central time. Uh, so come back tomorrow and through the next week. I hope to see you at some more sessions. Thanks again to our great presenters and everyone have a good night. Thanks for having us on. Thank you, you again. Everyone to come. Thank you. Bye. Bye all.